Hello, happy Sunday. Greetings, everyone. Hopefully you all are out here and you're doing well in terms of your mental, physical and spiritual well-being. We really hope that that's true and that you're maintaining yourself and um, getting the regeneration and the strength that you need to be a strong fighting force for justice and forward human progress in 2021 and beyond. So that's our sincere hope for you. And we are so happy that you have decided to join us uh, today um, for this very important topic of the radical side of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we start as we always do by acknowledging that this is an event sponsored by the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. And that um, we always begin by giving praise, honor, and respect to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. And when we say indigenous people, we're not talking about far out fantasies that some of our people have about um, the masses of us being indigenous to this hemisphere. We're not talking about that nonsense. We're talking about the indigenous people, the native people, the American Indian people, the people whose land this was stolen from. Um, who want their land back or who are engaged in a fight to get their land back. Um, just because you may not see that fight does not mean that it does not exist. Those of us who are involved in the struggle and work and have solidarity with the indigenous people know that they are fighting for their land back. They're not fighting for casinos, you all. They're fighting for this land that belongs to them and they have a right to get it back. And they may not get it back on January 3rd, 2021, but at some point they will get their land back here. So we acknowledge them and continue to offer our support for their struggle, for their self-determination and an end to this uh, reactionary settler colonial regime. And also we give our respect and thanks to our African ancestors who fought so diligently and you know january 1st we were reminded again of uh, january 1st 1804 and the haitian revolution the most successful slave revolt known to human civilization and also on that same day the victory of the cuban socialist revolution and if you know anything about cuba you know cuba is an african country primarily i know that uh you know, the, the capitalist media does not want you to understand that. They want you to look at Marco Rubio or whatever clowns they put out there and make you think that that's what Cuba looks like. But um, many of us have been there and studied the island and we know that's not Cuba. Cuba is an African country. And so those two examples demonstrate clearly for us um, that our ancestors have always struggled for justice from day one, hundreds of years later to today and forward, we will continue to do that. So we're thankful um, to step into those shoes and continue this fight. So we're really happy that you're here with us and we look forward to um, having um, this continue through 2021. When Shakur and I started doing this in March, um, we started doing it every week and we said, well, we'll do it you know, for a few weeks and we didn't really think much about it beyond that, we never thought that we would um, be doing it dozens of weeks later, some 30, 40 weeks later, and that we would continue. And so we're going to continue to do that. And we encourage you to, you know, use this session and these sessions to go out and get even more information. You know, obviously in an hour, we can't learn everything we need to know about any topic but use these to get whatever information you can about these very critical topics, okay? So with that, we'll go ahead and get started um, with our usual introductions. Uh, my name is Ajamu, organizer in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, um, have been for quite some time and um, have every intention of continuing to do so as long as I have breath in my body. And joining me, um, as always, is my outstanding daughter, Shakura, who um, is uh, in the midst of working to achieve her doctorate degree in public health. 
so that she can continue to build upon her activist work uh, around African women's health issues of which she is highly engaged. I've had the privilege and honor to participate with her in her um, activism and I'm very proud and honored to be able to share this platform with her every week. And again, for the All African People's Revolutionary Party, you all, our objective, what we're fighting for is Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. And if you want more information about that, you need look no farther than the book showing on the right, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, which was written in 1968 by Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah. And Kwame Nkrumah, when he wrote this book, he called for the founding of an all African people's revolutionary party, which would unite all of the pan-African formations on the ground in Africa who were fighting for one unified socialist Africa. So there underneath the book cover, you see logos of various organizations throughout the African continent, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. Azania is what you call South Africa. It's the actual name for that country. Um, the PAIGC, African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau, the Democratic Party of Guinea, the Party of Secretary, the Azanian People's Organization in Azania, the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School, Nigeria, Zimbabwe Movement for Pan-African Socialists, uh, Pan-African Union for Sierra Leone, and many others who have all agreed that the objective we need to achieve is one unified socialist Africa. So we work all of these organizations, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of people, we work as one for this objective. So Pan-Africanism is not just an idea, it's not just a theory, it's work that's happening on the ground as we speak to achieve it. And we have chapters all over the world, all throughout Africa. Um, I've had the honor and privilege of visiting and working within a number of them. And also um, throughout Europe, where I've also had the honor of uh, visiting chapters there and Canada, which I've also had the honor to do and throughout the United Snakes of America and the Caribbean. So we are, that's who we are. And that's uh, uh, definitely uh, praise and respect for all of the organizers, past, present and future for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And with that, we'll get started with today's topic, the radical side of Dr. Martin Luther King. And to get us going, as always, I will turn it over to Shakur. Thank you so much, Daddy. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, greetings. I hope that the new year has started off safe, healthy, and well for you and your loved ones, as well as people you care about. I just want to take this time before I start with my slides just to continue to encourage you to continue to push against the stream. So the whole purpose of these seminars is to help us all feel more comfortable or uncomfortable in some cases with being critical. And so that means challenging things because we know that at the end of the day, the norm of what we've been taught, so understanding that capitalism is our friend, right? Like that's the norm of what we've been taught. We need to be comfortable with pushing against those norms because a lot of times those norms are designed from a strategic standpoint to maintain oppression for uh, different people, no matter what they look like, uh, depending on their race, class, or gender. So we definitely wanna continue. I, we asked you last year to be open and to be willing to be challenged in different ways. And we stand by that. And we so we continue to ask you that for this year, specifically with the topics that you hear, and to, including today in terms of thinking about how people have the capabilities to do what they do and how they have the capabilities to make the world a better place. And so I just want you to think about, you know, if you're trying to figure out what is the first step, like how do you become a person that is well known in the community and in the world, like a Dr. Martin Luther King, you should think about how he first had to understand that he needed to take a stand, which meant being uncomfortable. And I'm sure at some point he decided to do some type of political education training. So he had to do some research and read and grow in that way. And so these are the strategies that you would develop if you were to try to take a stand and to contribute to making the world better. So I don't want you to think that you know, it's impossible for you. The, the question is, are you willing to have a growth mindset? And then what are you willing to do 
in terms of the PE, so the political education part, so that you can help to develop your toolbox, if you will, for how you would go about deconstructing oppression. And so, you know, just keep in mind, Dr. King didn't have, you know, a magic wand that he waved. He, he put these practices in motion because that was what he saw he needed to do. And we learned from our ancestors. That's why we continue to thank them for paving the way for us. And we hopefully will continue to take lessons from them so that we can continue to work towards doing this justice work that needs to be done. So with that, let's start this discussion by stating loud and clear that whatever your thoughts and or beliefs about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whether you agree with him 100% or you don't agree with him at all, no one can dispute that he was a man of principle. Even the most militant black power activists at that time, those who were opposite to King on many issues, people like Kwame Ture, as you may have known previously known as Stokely Carmichael, Cleve Sellers, or Mukasa Dada, also known as Willie Ricks, all of them agree that King was an honest man. This is important because a person of principle may take a while to change positions on critical topics, but their commitment to doing what's right, the very definition of dignity and principles, ensures that eventually they will come around to a correct position. And for a person of principle, this means they will do so despite whatever personal consequences result from their decision to do what is right. To understand the complexities of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you have to start by understanding that he was a person of principle who, unlike so many of the so-called Christians today, he understood clearly that a dedication to God cannot be separated from a commitment to do what is right, regardless of the consequences. I had the opportunity to travel to Montgomery last April uh, to present uh, some of my research on African women's health at the conference that I was invited to speak at. And um, as many of you know, they just opened another museum to highlight all of our ancestors who were brutally murdered via lynchings that took place across the United States. And so a lot of people refer to this museum as the lynching museum. And I remembered going to the first part where they had all the, uh, I don't wanna call them monuments, but they had all of the uh, place markers of people who had died depending on what state and county they lived in. And you're walking through and it's all hanging from your head or you might see some and read them at eye level. And so that's the first part of the museum. And then if you get on the shuttle, you take a five minute drive down more into the downtown part of Montgomery, Alabama, and you go to a physical building. So the first part is outside and then you go to a physical building where you are actually walking into a museum that is continuation of what you just left. The only difference and the significance of that second building is that it was actually built specifically on the same plantation rock that many African slaves were dropped off at when they came to Alabama. And if they were not mandated to go to Birmingham or if they were not mandated to go to Tuskegee, they were mandated to go to Montgomery. And so the significance of that building is you can literally feel the ancestors when you walk in. And I bring this up to you because we, we do understand that Dr. King had many com complexities, but unlike other Christians today, he understood that there was a dedication to God and he didn't, he didn't wanna separate that dedication from the commitment to do what's right. And he did that regardless of what possible outcomes could have happened. And so I remember when I went to the second part of the museum, the same building that the plantation rock was eventually uh, built upon, I remember seeing a bunch of pictures on the wall and they had different churches throughout the South that were chronically known for having lynchings that took place outside of their physical building. And yet the people who congregated, the people who attended, the people who consider themselves members of said church or said religion looked the other way, knowing that these lynchings were taking place outside. And they have little quotes under the pictures just to kind of help you think critically. And I remember one of the quotes saying, you know, what is this discourse around being a Christian but literally standing by and doing nothing when you see somebody being brutally murdered. Like, what does that discourse look like for you? And so I just wanna bring that to your attention as we continue to think about Dr. King and how 
he didn't have to raffle with that too much. He didn't have to grapple with that. He had a clear idea of what he wanted to do. And he knew that he wouldn't, uh, how do I say, he wouldn't negotiate his principles if it meant uh, encouraging inhumane treatment for other people. Had Dr. King lived longer than a mere 39 years, we certainly would have been able to witness him taking much more radical positions on a number of critical issues because any principal person who genuinely explores any issue will become more radicalized around that issue, especially as it relates to understanding the contradictions of this oppressive capitalist system. Next slide, please. King never got the opportunity to advance on all pertinent issues, but he clearly demonstrated the willingness to go against the grain on issues for principle. For example, against the urgings of the US government leaders, King who established a relationship with then Ghanaian President Kwame Nkrumah upon Ghana's independence in March of 1957, King attended Ghana's independence ceremony, developed a relationship with Nkrumah that evolved into a mentor. So this is the mentor that evolved with Nkrumah and it evolved into a mentor relationship. So the mentee was King and Nkrumah was the mentor and that's how they started enhancing the struggle for African people. The US government officials working overtime to assassinate, overthrow and discredit Nkrumah pressured King to discontinue his relationship with Nkrumah, to which King refused. In fact, Nkrumah remained a confidant and a mentor to King until King's assassination in 1968. Also, the US power structure pushing through the so-called establishment civil rights organizations during the 1960s, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, under the national leadership of Roy Wilkinson, Roy Wilkins, excuse me, and the National Urban League under the leadership of Whitney Young pressured King to denounce black power as a viable and legitimate movement. King struggled because of his commitment to nonviolence as a principle and his liberal capitalist orientation up to that point. But ultimately he refused to denounce the most radical element of the civil rights movement. And until his death, he remained a trusted, if not debated comrade to all sectors of the African movement for justice and forward progress. And I'm sure that we'll go into more detail about this as the seminar continues, but I also just wanna continue to encourage us, as I said before, to just be open and to not be afraid to do research. Don't be afraid to go out and invest in time to learn something new. And I say that because I live in Memphis, as a lot of you know. And so, you know, the Lorraine Motel, AKA the Civil Rights Museum, where Dr. King was assassinated, is probably about 35 minutes from where I reside. And so when we go to Memphis and we understand that that's where he was killed, we're not really talking about this radical side of him specifically in the museum. And that's a disservice to him. It's a disservice to his family. It's a disservice to his legacy. So this is why research is important. This is why information seeking is important. This is why a growth mindset is important because you can't just rely on backwards media or people who have a different agenda that is not humane to give you the information you need so that you can be better equipped to understand who our ancestors really were. And no one should have to tell you who you are. You should be able to seek that information yourself because you should want to learn that, right? So I just thank you all for being with us. And I encourage you to continue doing this learning. It's a growth process and it takes time, but we're in this together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shakura. Appreciate that. That's an outstanding foundation for how we wanna analyze Dr. King's work. And the first part of it, is we should talk a little bit about organizing work or organizational work or mobilizing work or just being in an organization because there's so much confusion about that. And a lot of times because capitalism teaches only from the perspective of individualism. So the way that we learned civil rights, for example, in school is that Dr. King was civil rights. George Washington was American independence. And that's how we learn things. So. The concept is that if there was no Dr. King, there wouldn't have been any civil rights since the entire civil rights movement is defined by his name and his picture. And so those of us who understand particularly how movements are formed and 
also African culture, which is collected. I don't care where you come from in the world. If you're African, you come from a collective culture. And if you don't know that, we're happy to prove that to you. There's no question about that. There's no debate about it. There's nowhere in the world where African people practice rampant individualism. That's just not who we are. It never has been and it never will be. So when we have this concept of individualism, we know that that's fallacious because that's just not how we roll. Just like the picture you see there of the youth from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, every decision that they made was collective. And that's how our organizations function. And so this concept of the lone Dr. King who made all the decisions, we know that that's not true. We know if Dr. King, who did not even want to become a leader of the movement at the time that he did during the Montgomery bus boycott movement, the Montgomery uh, Association in 1955, he was sitting in the back of the room eating. And one of the ministers, I believe C.T. Vivian, uh, nominated him to be the president of the Montgomery Boycott Association. So he did not even strive to do that. So the masses were ready to move. That's what you should take from that. The masses were ready to move. And if for some reason he would have not been at that meeting, they would have got Dr. Williams or, or Dr. Jones or, or Dr. Johnson or Dr. Lumumba, or whoever else was there and willing to take on the mantle because it's the masses of people who make history, not individuals. If Dr. King didn't run out there in the civil rights marches by himself, had he done that, he would have been shot and lynched and killed and you would have never known who he was. Um, the reason why you know him is specifically because of the thousands of people who went out with him. So you cannot just make this an individual analysis. And in terms of his work, he didn't make decisions on his own. He, he belonged to an organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or the SCLC, SCLC worked with other organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC or the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE or as Shakur mentioned, the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and National Urban League. So. All of these organizations, the strategy for the civil rights movement, they would have discussions like you see in the picture to the left. And Dr. King was not the owner of those discussions. He was not the uh, arbitrator of those discussions. He was a participant in those discussions. And so that's important to understand because if you don't understand that and you, you know, don't challenge this backward narrative that, well, he was in the civil rights movement, then what you're left with is a dysfunctional perspective that everything that you have learned about him was him, when in reality, no. Um, he was a part of a movement. And because he was a part of a movement, the power structure that does not want to be overturned by that movement understands that it's in its best interest to convince you that there was no movement, it was just him. And so when they eliminate him, then there's nothing else that can be done. And so, you know, there's all we can do is just accept the reality of what we deal with under this oppressive system. When the truth is, is that any one of us can be, can have the influence that Dr. King had. In fact, some of you here have skills that equal and or exceed Dr. King's, whether you believe it or not, that's true objectively. And in the future, we will, have people born that are not even here yet who will have skills that equal and or exceed Dr. King, Kwame Nkrumah, Asada Shakur, Malcolm X, Carmen Piera. Uh, this is an objective reality. And we understand that because again, we understand African culture. So that's important to understand. And if you understand that and you recognize how organizations move collectively and how decisions are made based on these types of consensus models and that this is a part of African culture. Like if you go to, I belong to an African organization. I'm sorry, but if you're not African, you're not a part of the organization I belong to. So we have meetings. I had one this morning and we have, we have them all the time. I had one yesterday. And in both the meeting I had today and the one I had yesterday, there's people on the conference call 
from all parts of Africa, people from Europe, all over the world that are on these calls, because that's how the all African people's revolutionary party is structured. And so, you know, we just we get serious work done, but there's also laughter, there's jokes, there's there's human interaction because that's a part of African culture. So, you know, you have to understand that in order to understand how we move, how people like Dr. King move. You have to understand that collective element. So when Dr. King participated in these meetings, these youth from SNCC and CORE, they pushed Dr. King to the left. Dr. King acknowledged that. Many times he acknowledged that. He was not ready himself to take a stance against the Vietnam War, for example, on April 4th, 1967. But he was pushed by these youth activists to do that. And because he, as Chakura mentioned, he was a man of principle, he abided by that push to do the right thing. And against the urgings and the pressure of US government officials and pretty much all of the mainstream civil rights movements, NAACP, Urban League, to force him not to take a position against the Vietnam War, he did do that. And the I would argue the best speech he ever gave was April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church in New York. Why I oppose the war in Vietnam? It's a vehemently anti-capitalist speech. You, you won't hear that in a couple of weeks when capitalism commemorates his birthday. They, they will never play you snippets from the why I polls, the war in Vietnam speech, because if you heard that speech, you would have a totally different perspective of Dr. Martin Luther King. Because in that speech, he talks about how capitalism is the impetus behind the Vietnam War. And it, this, this question is a question of poor people fighting against the super rich. And they don't want you to understand that about Dr. King. They, they want you to think all he wanted to do was have little black boys and black white boys and white girls and black girls hold hands and sing songs. That's all they want you to know about Dr. King. So this evolution on the part of his politics resulted from his collective struggle with the youth in the movement who radicalized him it's very important that we understand that because we don't we don't understand that. That's why we don't understand how change takes place. That's why we don't get that. We don't understand how things change from one thing to another. And if we don't understand that, that's why we think things will always be the way they are now. So you got to understand the masses of people make history. And so as long as you know that, you know anything is possible because people can accomplish anything. So. King's life is just simply an example of that. And so when King took that position, and it's we're not trying to argue that King took progressive positions on every issue because there were some issues where he didn't uh, advance, he didn't have time to advance the way he probably would have had he lived longer. Certainly the question of Zionism, SNCC was the first national organization in the United States to take an anti-Zionist position in 1967. And you should study Sister Ethel Minor. You know, we don't, we don't give women identifying people the credit in history that they deserve, but you should study Sister Ethel Minor, M-I-N-O-R, who was a member of the Nation of Islam. And when Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, she left when he left. And she joined his organization of Afro-American unity. And Malcolm X had strong anti-Zionist politics because the Nation of Islam, you can say what you want, but they had strong anti-Zionist politics. And really, they were really the first organization to even you know, raise that concept, even before SNCC did. And so uh, when Malcolm was assassinated, Ethel Minor joined SNCC, and she was the one who SNCC organizers widely credit with bringing the anti-Zionist platform into SNCC. You know, everybody's anti-Zionist today, which is wonderful, but it's important you understand that back in that time, nobody was anti-Zionist, and Dr. King was a Zionist. There was an organization called BASIC, Black Americans in Support of Israel, and Dr. King was a board member in that organization. So had he lived longer, because he's a man of principle, we are sure that he would have 
altered his position on that question, but he didn't get around to that. And Zionism is an insidious question, but he was able to reach a point of consciousness around the Vietnam War, no question, and around economics to a large degree. And SNCC was the organization that played a pivotal role in the anti-Vietnam War movement in this country. The anti-Vietnam War movement in this country is widely portrayed as a movement led by the white left. I mean, what, what isn't portrayed that way? But the truth is, the reason why the anti-war movement against Vietnam was successful because of, was because of the work done to smash the draft. You don't have a draft in this country today. You have not had a draft in this country for 50 weeks, 50 years. Why? Because what the power structure learned from this movement that was led by SNCC, the Smash the Draft movement, it was Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael, who coined the phrase, hell no, we won't go. That was a part of the Smash the Draft movement. You should know this history because you think white people were the ones who were engaged in an anti-war movement and we didn't have anything to do with that. We were in the forefront of the anti-war movement. And that smashing of the draft, that's why they have not brought the draft back since. Because what SNCC was able to do was mobilize a movement where people were able to see the atrocities of the war and began to equate those atrocities and the death of 55,000 people from this country to the draft. And so that's why there's no draft here today. And Dr. King never denounced the smash the draft movement despite immeasurable pressure against him to do that. And you have to understand how militant a position that was in 1967. If, if these capitalists imposed a, went to war today and imposed a draft today, most of you today wouldn't have an outward anti-draft position. Most of you today would sign up for selective services. I don't care what you say your politics are, you would do it because they would push you and tell you that if you didn't do it, you get five years in prison. And because you don't have political education and you don't have a, a real uh, uh, concrete commitment to those principles, you would buckle under. A lot of you would. It's, it's, I'm not throwing shade at you. It's just an objective fact. You would buckle under and you would sign up for selective service and make yourself eligible for the draft. And I can say that because I've said this in past seminars, I never signed up for selective service, which you were required to do when I was 18. And because of that, I forfeited the right to uh, achieve uh, financial aid and was not able to go to law school as I had been accepted to Bolt Hall Law School in UC Berkeley in 1984. Look it up if you think I'm lying. So, and that's fine. I didn't, you know, that, clearly that was not what I wanted or needed to do. But my point is, is that I'm not talking about something that I wouldn't do because I had the FBI come to my house threatening me because not only did I not sign up for selective service, but we were organizing anti-military uh, um, plays on high school campuses. So, you know, I understand what it means to live by a life of principle and to deal with the consequences, no matter what they are. So that's how we're talking about Dr. King. He refused to denounce the smash the draft movement. Another thing, you know, because they, they want to, the power structure here, they want to uh, portray King as, you know, just simply through the eyes of nonviolence, which we'll talk about next. Um, and, you know, just the same snippet from the I Have a Dream speech. But as Shakura mentioned, Dr. King formed a close relationship with revolutionary socialist Pan-Africanist Kwame Nkrumah, who the US government eventually overthrew in a central intelligence agency, or we call them criminals in action, inspired coup d'etat on February 24th, 1966. So the US government had no intention of Dr. King. You got to realize Dr. King at that time would go to the White House to meet with presidents. He would have audience with John F. Kennedy. And after John F. Kennedy got blown away, he had audience with Lyndon Johnson. He didn't get it. He didn't live long enough to do that with Nixon. But had he lived long enough, he probably would have, Nixon would have probably been forced to do that with him too. So 
these people, you know, he was he was meeting with the spokesperson, the bourgeoisie clowns, the spokespersons for this power structure. So you know they didn't want him having relationships with no revolutionary Pan-Africanists that they were trying to assassinate and overthrow. But he did it anyway, because he was a man of principle. He didn't have to, You everybody's seen that picture of him with Malcolm X in 1964 during the, uh, the uh, legislative hearings on the civil rights bill. He didn't have to take that picture. And, and he took on president pressure for posing in that picture, that's just that picture. We don't have any evidence. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy. Oh, he and Malcolm were working together. I had a brother the other day was telling me, oh yeah, they had several meetings together. I'm like, where's your evidence of that? I don't have any evidence of that. So we don't have any evidence. Maybe it happened, I don't know. Maybe they kept it out of the public eye, but there's no evidence that they had any other meeting, those two men, Malcolm and Martin, other than that brief handshake and exchange they had uh, in 1964, the picture that you've all seen. And he didn't have to take that picture. He could have avoided it. If Malcolm X was alive today, most of you, if you've seen him, you would avoid a picture with him because your job would get you in trouble and you, you just don't have that kind of courage, unfortunately. But he took that picture. And that says a lot about his principle. And then here in this picture, he's meeting with the man on the left who is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad the longtime leader of the Nation of Islam. And I mean, there's just no way, <laughs> there's no way that Dr. King sitting here meeting, being photographed with Elijah Muhammad was doing anything to uh, endear him with the forces of the power structure. Yet he did that with Nkrumah, with Malcolm, with Kwame Ture, with Mukasa Dada, with Elijah Muhammad. He maintained those kind of relationships and that's why those people respected him because he was that kind of man of principle. Even though by doing those things, that did a lot to set in motion the uh, efforts by the U.S. administration to discredit him and eventually their successful effort in assassinating him. Um, Robert F. Kennedy was the one who approved the wiretap, the initial wiretaps on Dr. King's phone. And then they created that package of discrediting information about him. And some of you all, oh, Robert F. Kennedy was a progressive leader. You know, Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy, that's three Ks. So you know what that means. So that's who those people represented for those of us who know what they actually did and how they actually sabotaged any true movements for justice. And King knew who they were. King knew they were all a bunch of snakes. And so... That's the king they don't want you to know. So they want to constantly pump this thing where he all he was concerned about was nonviolence. You know, you could uh, walk up to King and bash him in his face and he wouldn't do anything. They don't want you to understand the Dr. King who maintained principal relationships with militants and revolutionaries. They don't want you to know that Dr. King. And they don't want you to know the truth that Dr. King did see nonviolence as a principle. And we've talked many times about the difference between principles and tactics. But I know a lot of people don't understand the difference just based on how they move and act. So we'll do it again and we'll continue to do it. So principles are values that you have that govern your life. Like for example, if you have, fortunately, if, if you have parents that are alive, um, and you have a good relationship with them. And I hope that that's true because I, I miss my parents every day. Um, but if you have that and you love your parents or you have children or siblings or loved ones, partners, you love those people. And you, I'm sure if you're a person of principle, you would say your love for those people is uncompromising which means not, nobody can come and offer you money to kill your loved ones. You would never accept. There's no price that you would accept that. That's because your love for them is a principle. It cannot be compromised. That's what a principle is. A tactic is simply a method you use to achieve an objective. And your tactics will change based on their effectiveness. You might use one tactic today and it works great, 
you might use the same tactic tomorrow that doesn't work at all, so you'll change that tactic. So you can't confuse principles and tactics. They're two completely different things. Principles, you never compromise. Tactics, you change based on effectiveness. So this is a, a, a great confusion um, in this movement because even Dr. King, we would argue was confused on this question because he saw uh, nonviolence as a principle, just like many of you see voting as a principle. Voting is clearly a tactic, you all. It's not a principle, it's a tactic. And stop lying and saying, well, other people died for the right to vote. You're trying to make it a principle. But I don't care how many times you say that, it's not true. Voting is a tactic, it's just one tactic. You use it when it works, you don't use it when it doesn't. Plain and simple as that. It's not a principle. The capitalist system wants us to believe it's a principle, because if we believe that, we'll never try anything else except that. And they got us right where they want us because they control the electoral process in this, in this society. So you got to know the difference between principles and tactics. Dr. King, in our estimation, erred by making nonviolence a principle. And he maintained that until his death. But there's still strong evidence, even despite that, that he be, he. Began, well, at least we know for sure that he that he uh, allowed certain things to happen despite his stand on nonviolence. And he's not here, so we can't ask him how he reconciled, you know, the paradox of two things existing together that seemingly shouldn't exist together. But he did that. And what we mean is that he owned a gun permit. And most people don't realize that, but he owned a gun permit. And, and you don't own a gun permit unless you intend on owning firearms. And he did, at one point, own firearms. Now, because of pressure that he received from people like Bayard Rustin, who was really the architect behind this nonviolence as a principle nonsense, um, he eventually did away, um, gave away his firearms. But he did have them because he was no fool and he understood the importance of that. And even after he gave his firearms away, King still did not reject the presence of armed security during the civil rights movement. He did not reject the presence of armed security during the civil rights movement. Uh, the deacons for defense were armed, you all, and they patrolled along the march routes. If you look at video of marches like the March Against Fear or what's called the Black Power March of June of 1966, you will see that the Deacons for Defense patrolled along that march. And they were the reason why there was no widespread violence. There were, there were hundreds, thousands of white supremacists and racist sheriffs and racist National Guards people out there. And the reason why there was no widespread violence, I don't care what you say, the reason why there was no widespread violence because we have spent plenty of time with the people who were there, okay? So they will tell you, you, you talk to people like Mukasa Dada, he's still alive, he's in Atlanta, Georgia today. Those people like that who were there, who organized during the March Against Fear, they will tell you that the deacons were a major force in preventing those white supremacists from bringing harm. Dr. King knew they were there because Kwame Ture at the press conference when the civil rights organizations took over the march in Memphis, Tennessee in June of 1966 after James Meredith was shot, the civil rights organizations came in. SCLC through Dr. King, SNCC through Kwame Ture who was Stokely Carmichael then and CORE through Floyd McKissick. They came in, had a press conference in Memphis and said, we're going to continue the James Meredith March Against Fear. And it was during that march that Snick unveiled the Black Power chant to replace SCLC's Freedom Now chant. And they debated about having the Deacons for Defense there. And the NAACP and the Urban League said, if the Deacons for Defense are there with those guns, we're withdrawing from the march. And that meant all the money that they uh, collected through donations would be taken away from the march. And the march needed that money. And SNCC and CORE were like, we're, we're going to have the deacons. The deacons are going to be there. 
And it was Dr. King who was the deciding vote, and Dr. King did not vote to oust the deacons from the mark, knowing that the deacons were armed. He did not do that. And you will not hear that on the Chevron-sponsored ads commemorating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But if you study it for yourself, it's an irrefutable fact. In fact, you can see pictures on the internet of Dr. Martin Luther King standing in pictures with a man called Charles Sims. Charles Sims was a man who spent prison time for assault, armed robbery, and all types of those types of things, but he was a leader in the Deacons for Defense. Charles Sims didn't go nowhere without his 45 semi-automatic pistol on him. Everybody in the civil rights movement knew that. And Charles Sims was Dr. Martin Luther King's personal bodyguard. 45 and all, you all, 45 and all. He was his personal bodyguard. And the SNCC organizers joked about that. Kwame Ture used to tell us all the time how they used to joke with King because when King got ready to go somewhere, he would be like, where's Charles Sims? He didn't want to go nowhere without Charles Sims and that 45. So don't tell us that Dr. King was just, it was just nonviolence and that was it. I don't know how he reconciled that. You know, he's not here to explain that to us, but he clearly did in one way or fashion. My answer to that is that since you cannot, as I said, compromise principles, my conclusion is that he had reached a point where nonviolence was really not a principle for him anymore, even though he practically knew it could not be a principle in terms of the movement, he felt that he could not publicly say that. That's, that, that's the most viable and logical explanation for how these things happen. But it certainly was a preview into the growing militancy and the growing radicalization of Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's just so interesting to wonder, had he lived longer, what would have happened? And we would argue that that's the reason why he didn't live longer. Because even if you wanna accept the power structure's version of Dr. King, the power structure knew that that wasn't who Dr. King was and they knew they had to eliminate him. And so you should make no mistake about it. It was this government that killed Dr. Martin Luther King. There's no question about that. And, and there's a number of books. There are at least six books that outline the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. So when if you disagree with what I just said, until you've studied all those books, because I have multiple times. So until you've done that, I, I don't even want to hear because you don't know what you're talking about. OK, when you do the research, then we can come back and have a debate and we'll be happy to explain to you you know, why you don't know what you're talking about if you're still trying to say that it was just James Earl Ray or somebody that assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was clearly assassinated because of his growing militancy and the inability of the US government. They knew that they could not control him like they control most civil rights leaders even today, like they control Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton or all of these politicians in the Congressional Black Caucus today. I know some of you don't like to hear that, but they control these people. These people do not speak independently. They don't have, they're not independent African voices for freedom and justice. They're controlled by the corporations who donate to their campaigns. So Dr. King was not one of those people and they knew that and that's why he was assassinated. And if you don't believe that, all you gotta do is read J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI's counterintelligence documents. And they say in the document to present the, the rise of a black messiah, they say that Martin Luther King would have become more radicalized had he lived. They say that, and they know that because they're the ones that killed him. So there's no question about Dr. King moving farther to the left. And this last year, if you're paying attention, was a clear indication of his movement to the left, a clear indication. And not only that, it cemented his developing anti-capitalist position that he portrayed in his latter speeches, the speech he gave the night before he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Shakur told you about that, you know, right there, the speech he gave there, the speech he gave, I mentioned earlier at the Riverside Church, a year to the day before he was assassinated in New York. He, articulated, if you read those speeches, you all, 
he has clear language in there talking about how capitalism will never meet the needs of humanity. That's a dangerous person. And he had a mass following too, he had to go. And so, you know, if you just look at what he was engaged in, when he went to Chicago in early, uh, in, in 1966, it was involved in an anti-poverty movement in the North, he expanded beyond the Southern US. Clearly this was Chicago. It wasn't a question of legalized segregation because that didn't exist in Chicago. They certainly had segregation. They had de facto and they had all kinds of, uh, of redlining and all of these things that still exist in 2021, but it wasn't legalized Jim Crow like the South. So Dr. King clearly was able to see that and understand that this is a reflection of the inequities of the capitalist system. And he talked about that. His latter speeches before he was killed were filled with references. We're not trying to say that Dr. King was, a, he didn't live long enough to understand socialism. He was still embodied with, you know, the, the backward values of the system and they murdered him before he could develop to that point. But we're saying had he lived long enough, it would have been very interesting to see how he would have evolved because he was clearly no question moving in that direction. And if you look at what he was doing in Memphis, look, y'all, he was in Memphis to support garbage workers. He was there to support a labor uh, uprising in Memphis. If you don't see that as a challenge against this economic system of capitalism, I, I don't know, I, I really don't know what to tell you at that point. This had, this, this was not just a struggle against segregation laws in Memphis. It was a struggle to create stronger working conditions for the oppressed. And one of the big things like, you know, the evidence is all around us. Like even today, there's a poor people's march. It was the SCLC that started that in 1967. And the poor people's march is all was all about, even though there's so many efforts in the campaign, even today, not to talk about the need to eradicate capitalism because you can't eradicate poverty without eradicating capitalism. There's no way to do it. You, nobody can come here and articulate how poverty can be eradicated while capitalism stays intact. Nobody can do that. Why? Because capitalism is based on economic inequity. That's what capitalism is. The reason why this is the richest country in the world is because it was built on the theft of indigenous land and the enslavement of my African ancestors. All of the corporate uh, infrastructure in this country was built from that process. The banking industries were built from seed money, from the transatlantic slave trade, the insurance industry, Aetna, New York Life, they started from money they got from selling my ancestors, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Duche Bank, Barclays, they started from money they got from selling my ancestors. Brooks Brothers suits started by making clothes for my ancestors to wear while they were picking cotton. And if you don't believe that, you're like, well, he's he just a mad black man raving crazy on the internet. All you have to do is do that dirty four letter word read and all those companies I just named because of the pressure of the reparate, the real reparations movement, not these fools on YouTube today, but the real reparation movement that's been around for decades have forced them to acknowledge their role in our enslavement of our people. And so if you Google Brooks Brothers and slavery, they, they've issued statements. I know that because I've researched and seen the statements they issued. They've issued statements. So you can see it for yourself if you want to. So this system is built you all on inequity. So all you all that keep trying to find some way to make capitalism uh, coexist with our collective upliftment, that's never gonna happen, <laughs> okay? That cannot happen. This system has to be destroyed. And Dr. King under was starting to understand that and his work in Memphis when he was killed was clear evidence of that. He was not there in Memphis telling the garbage workers, well, you have to, you know, all you have to do is just work hard and you'll get, you know, the economic progress within the capitalist system that you deserve. He was telling them that they have to be ready to shut this system down to get justice. That's why he became so dangerous. If he would have continued to just talk about 
integration, he would still be alive today. If Malcolm X had continued to just say, well, white people are devils, he would still be alive today. The reason why they were assassinated is because their analysis evolved to one where they recognized that the freedom struggle objectives they were pursuing are tied to the exploitation of this capitalist economic system. And so if you wanna honor them, you cannot deny that. You cannot deny that that's what they were working for. It, it's an insult to them giving their lives. And for those of you that are Christians, stop going to those, you should, every time you go to church and those chicken wing pigs feet pastors you're listening to, they get up there and talk about Jesus paid the price because you couldn't pay the price. You better stand up and disrupt that service. That's why I can't go in churches because that's what I, when I used to be invited, I used to stand up and be disruptive in there and they would kick me out because I would tell them, how can you say we can't pay the price? Didn't Martin Luther King pay the price? Didn't Malcolm pay the price? Didn't Patrice Lumumba pay the price? Didn't Bunchy Carter and, and John Huggins pay the price? Didn't all these, didn't Amil Car Cabral pay the price? All these people paid the price. So that's a that, that that's just confusion there to again make us believe that there's not really anything we can do except you know be consumers and buy up everything in capitalism and get get oh uh, just just consume and then die and then based on that nothing life you're supposed to go to some fictional heaven well you can believe that if you want to but I would say save yourself some time and money and just go get some crack and get high. And real Christians like Dr. Martin Luther King understood that that's not what Christianity was about. And I know some of y'all that Christians are mad, but we don't care if you're mad because our job is to tell the truth. And if you're truly a Christian, you would demand the truth and you can't refute, you can get mad, but you can't refute anything that we're saying about any of these issues. You can't refute a single thing about it. And if you can, we sure wish you would. We're happy to show you where the confusion is. So. We want to ask you again, because the only way we can honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and everybody who struggles for justice is we have to continue their work. That's the only way we do it. We can't just wear a t-shirt with their image on it. That's not honoring them. That's just giving you something fly to wear. The only way we can honor them is continuing their work, you all. So as we do every time, we invite you, and many of you have responded, and that's beautiful. We invite you to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And we have comrades listening in here from all over the world. Uh, have our good comrade, sister from the Caribbean, um, making a note, listening. So we're all over the world. We're building. And we, we need your help. We can't do it without you. We need your skills to do it. So we ask you where you see aaprp-intl.org, go to that site and say, I wanna join. I wanna join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And we'll uh, talk to you about what's needed to do that. Plus there's such great information on there about the work that we're doing. And then the second uh, title there, A Better World Down Me, A Jamu Umi's Truth Challenge. That's the, the uh, blog that I write. And there's articles there, um, information there, videos. These videos are stored there. Um, after we do them live like we are now, as well as on YouTube. And so you can watch those again, or you can give them to people who weren't able to make it. You know, even if you want to gather food around and laugh and say, this, these people are clowns, then that's, that's okay, because it's still political education. So join, if you don't want to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party, if you cannot, then join some organization working for justice or start the, I'll be glad when five o'clock comes and they stop talking organization and organize for justice under that or and, and I and we will help you we will give you our templates for our political education program and anything you need to start the I'll be glad when five o'clock comes and they stop talking organization but you got to be in an organization hoodcommunist.org uh, is wonderful writings from wonderful African revolutionaries you won't get it anywhere else all African people's revolutionary party uh, Black Alliance for Peace, a wonderful organization. Black Hammer, a wonderful organization. Cooperation Jackson, wonderful organization. All of these organizations and many more, you can find writings from there. 
So please support these sources for information and join us next week, Sunday, January 10th, same time, four to five. We're gonna be talking about the titles a little different. We're challenging this confusion around the American descendants of slaves or Ados. And so the topic next week is Pan-Africanism versus Ados. And you don't have to be African to, to learn about this. Y'all need to learn about it because you always talk about Black Lives Matter and you don't know anything about the African liberation movement. So you need to learn about it too. And so next week it's Pan-Africanism versus Ados. And if you don't know about Pan-Africanism and you don't know about Ados, then that's why you need to be here. OK, so we appreciate each and every one of you. We love you. Appreciate you. Maintain your mental, physical and spiritual health. Please join an organization working for justice. Uh, commemorate Dr. King as the radical, uncompromising person that he was. Smash patriarchy forward ever, backwards, never ready for revolution. Have a great rest of your Sunday evening.